just want to make sure we're live on YouTube. Oh my God. I feel Easy. like we're so technical. <laughs> When we're really not. It's very, very, we're impressed, but that's it's that's how easy it is if anybody wants to try it. Okay, so it's now streaming, so I'm gonna I feel like we're so happy. Wow, this is crazy. When we're really so not, what do you do here? Very, you just gotta turn off the YouTube. Yeah. What happened? I hear people. I hear people too. Right here. No. Not MD. Go into this. Uh, I'm come back to the meeting. We're just going to be a sec. <laughs> Did you not just say how technically ch we are? We are challenged. Let's do that. I'm just going to go like this. Um. Okay, oh my god, okay, that was not right. Here, just hit that. No? Um. Is everything still there? Oh my god, my account. Oh, here we are. Good. Okay, you. And we are, welcome, welcome, everybody. Do we have everybody in, do you think? I think so. so people are still coming in, so we, we just want to just welcome we are officially passing on of course we were uh, if people were participating whips were included but this is our official cast on party for our comfort fade party joining us today is andrea andrea mowry is the designer for the comfort fade comfort fade party and Amy, as well as Julia from La Bien Me, who have dyed all of the Comfort Fade kits that were originally um, knit in the pattern. And Amy has knit a couple or a few Comfort Fade Cardies. Yes. I've so knit I love two. That. Two? I've knit two. Yeah. So I feel like we can pick your brain for your experience and any tips and tricks and all of that kind of thing. I love hearing you know, somebody's past experience. And obviously you love knitting it if you made a couple of them. So that's great. Uh, we're also streaming on YouTube. So everybody has a chance um, if they wanted to come and be in our Zoom meeting this morning, but also it's going to be on our YouTube channel. You can reference later. We're just going to save it. Oh, admit all. Okay, there's more people waiting. Okay, yeah. awesome. Perfect. Okay, great um so this is so fun this is a such a good weekend i was so looking forward to this too. there's been a really big build up with the yarn the announcement of the cow and now we get to actually ask andrea a few questions about how this pattern kind of came to be totally welcome andrea thank you so much for coming thanks for having me i'm so excited anytime where are you coming to us from today uh maine Portland, Maine. I was, let's, can you see out my window at all? It's probably it just really sunny. glary. It looks it's just glary. It is sunny. We had a tease of spring and then it got bitter cold, but now the sun's back and we're crossing That's our fingers. Sounds like Canada. It yeah. sounds just like us. Yeah, so beautiful. <laughs> we're dying to actually come out that way. It's so beautiful where you're from. I you love should. that. Yes. yes, you should. You can come by way of Canada. There's all those great yarn shops up in Montreal. Then just yes. head straight down. Okay, plan, done. And you got up. a place to stay. What? <laughs> We're, don't, don't, don't even mess. say that. <laughs> I've got this whole studio. Oh my gosh, we could sleep in Andrea's yarn room. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so I have I have a I have a question to start with okay when you were thinking about designing this sweater when the when the when the idea came to you did the finished product look like the conception idea yeah did it which doesn't always happen I mean typically you kind of have an idea but then as you're going things change but I think this was like exactly what I had hoped and dreamed. Because you'd been fading. Okay, we have to talk about fade. Okay, like, let's back it up. Let's back it up because was Find Your Fade the first fade? The beautiful- Yes, in the sense that everybody 
as far as everybody thinks about a fade, find your fade was the first, but I actually tried with my rain shawl, which would have been like the winter before find your fade. Okay. That was my first attempt at like shifting from one color to another using stitch patterns and kind of like melting. And then right. it transformed into the fade. I did see something where you talked about that find your fade where you were just giving yourself permission to cast on this sequence of colors that you just loved. Is that correct? Is that yeah. how it sort of came to be? Yeah, I had actually just had my second child. And so I was, you know, I had a two year old and an infant and was the my business was in its infancy as well. And so one day I just went a little crazy and decided to pull all my yarn out without thinking about the fact that I would have to put it all back and decided to reorganize it. And while my yarn was all laying out, the colors of Find Your Fade were all kind of near each other. And I started noticing that in some of the pinks, there was these gold speckles. And then in some of the golds, there was these pink speckles. And I knew I was like, I, I've got to be able to get from point A to point B. And so then I just filled in all the spots. But yeah, it wasn't, I didn't know if it was something I would ever publish. It was completely selfish. I was like, I just want to cast on and knit something that fills me back up from early motherhood. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I mean, I guess, can we ask too, we mean, now that you're just this amazing established designer and we go to Ravelry and we see pages of designs, where does that start? Where did you learn to knit? Who taught you? And kind of when did it become like a lifestyle? Yes. So I learned it when I was about nine, I think. My grandma taught me. She doesn't. She didn't remember teaching me, oh. uh, but she did. And she always just knit afghans. So she, I didn't learn how to cast on or bind off. I only learned the knit stitch. So she cast on for me, and I basically knit like a blanket for my teddy bear, and that planted the seed. And then when I was a teenager, I was kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I went into a bookstore and got Stitch and Bitch and retaught myself how to knit. And from there, the obsession just never simmered down. You know, I got all the Elizabeth Zimmerman books. Mm -hmm. And especially with Elizabeth Zimmerman, the way that she writes is very empowering where you don't feel reliant on a pattern. She's very much just like, get some yarn, figure out your gauge and now right. do this. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> so early on, I kind of played with creating patterns um, and I did attempt, I loved it so much that I thought, how could I make this my job? I just love this more than anything else. And I tried to get a pattern in a book and it did not get accepted. And if you oh. scroll back in my Instagram feed, you can see it and you'll see why it didn't get accepted. Oh. What it was, was it? What was the pattern? Um, it's so bad. It was basically, so I went to a school where I had to wear a uniform. So it took me a long time in my adult life to figure out how to dress myself. <laughs> and so at this age in my early 20s, Style I was kind of, <laughs> I was figuring it out. You know, I kind of like to think of myself as like a hippie, but also like a outdoorsy, sporty person. And so I thought it would be a good idea to knit a tube top out of like I lived in New Zealand at the time and I picked out like the scratchiest New Zealand wool and brown and then I thought but I should embellish this so oh, I added oh. a beautiful <laughs> intarsia tree oh, onto oh. this tube top with no shaping it was literally ribbing potato sack ribbing at the bottom so I did have to add a strap you know to hold it up sure and then just to make sure everyone got the vibe I was putting out there, I included a heart on the trunk of the tree. Aww. But then to be really clear, I actually wrote tree hugger. That no, you did so, not. Oh, I did. Really did. Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so everybody knows how original the pattern is then. I mean, that didn't come from oh, anywhere yeah. but your amazing imagination. Oh, yeah. That, is so that was I think that's all really, me. I think I love that story so much that... You were so excited and passionate and you wanted it to reflect you so much. So is that something that is still true? Like your patterns reflect where you are and what you wanna wear or do you 
look at like Pinterest and trends and fashion? And is this how you choose colors and themes? And yeah, that's a great question. I am, I have to kind of remind myself that I'm technically in the fashion industry. I've never been one to follow trends. I do not like to match. I'm, it drives, it still drives my mother nuts. I'm in my late thirties and she can't handle that. I really, if I match, I'll change to undo that. So I've never kind of followed that norm. Um, so I've always, I think the way I've described it, and I think it's part of the reason why my little business has been successful is I follow whatever makes me feel super joyful so when I'm picking out yarn, I like to keep as much yarn as I can safely out on, you know, my shelves and everything and whatever just like makes me feel super happy. So back to find your fade. That was also the first time I really played with speckles. And every time a little speck of a different color would go across my needle, it was like, oh, oh, like it, it just made me so happy. And so that's very much what's always led any of my designs. It's usually curiosity, wanting to learn something new and what makes me feel really joyful in that moment. So I also will pick colors I know don't look good on me because I love them and I don't care if they look good on me. You know, it's just, I, yeah, I think I've always tried to be really true to my heart and just lead with that. I love that for so many reasons. First, first of all, because people say, Oh, you shouldn't wear whatever color and you shouldn't wear whatever yeah. style, but if it makes you feel good, that to me is the number one thing. And that's why we knit or make our own garments. We, that's why we modify them to make the fit our perfect fit or the colors are perfect colors. Yes. Right? How do you feel about yeah. that? Like when you're a designer and then you see all these projects popping up and somebody has modified the length or the whatever, the, the ribbing, the collar, the, how does that feel when you get to see all of that? I love that. I think that is as knitters, that's our superpower. Totally. And that is the main thing that I try to kind of fight against when I'll, I'll get certain questions from people, or I have people being like, I think I need to learn a different way to knit. There's a pressure there that, oh, you should only knit in this style. And I'm like, no, you should do whatever makes you feel good. Like if you look, I mean, I, I'm looking up at my knitting books, but there is a million ways to do each and every technique in knitting. So if you don't like the way that's prescribed in that pattern, like short rows, there are so many different ways to do short rows or half the time you could probably leave them out and it wouldn't make that big of a difference because knitting is like, it's a drapey, stretchy fabric. You know, we're not sewn in to these tight seams and so we can really be fluid with it and play with it and pick the ways that make us happy like you can choose your knitting needle that you prefer do you like double pointed do you like circulars and your colors your fabric you know some people can't use wool I love wool it's pretty much all I use but there's so many options out there colors some people aren't going to get down with neons or speckles or whatever it may be where I'm like, but they're so fun. Right. So I very fun. much like modify, yeah. make it yours. So, um, I love that advice because we've got, we've gotten so many people reaching out or comments like, Oh, I, I would never cut a do a cut in heel. That would stress me out. I would never do this. Knitting should be relaxing. So I love that message. Make it your own don't follow the pattern like it's written if it's not going to work for you. Just make it fun, right? Knitting should be fun. Yeah. I yes, you can always pull it out. Yes, exactly. That's what I was just going to say. Knitting's just knitting. and You can unknit it really fast. And I know that as a young knitter, that was, ah, like, what do you mean pull it out? I'm not pulling this out. Do you know how long this took me to do? But you've learned this new skill and now you're going to re-knit it and possibly do it much better. And you're going to be so proud of yourself. I feel like those are those yeah. moments where you're just like, Hey, this was not as hard as I thought it was going to be. And look how cool it is. Yeah. And it's a stepping stone. What you learn in that moment, every time we have to tear something out and fiddle around with it, you're the next time you do a different project, you're going to have all that in the back of your head. Like I talk a lot about my magic numbers, which are for me, I write down my numbers for me specifically that I know work really well for me. For instance, if I'm knitting a drop shoulder sweater, I know that 10 inches of ease, so I'm a 35 inch bust, so 45 inches is like my magic number, perfect 
for me. So I can use that information to go forward being like, same with like sleeve length. I know if it's a raglan, I like 18 inches. I know if it's three quarter, I like 14 inches. So by jotting down all these numbers, every time you try something, then you're like, oh, now I can put this into the next project I do and feel more confident and even more relaxed and joyful as I do it. But it's all knitting. So having to tear back, you just get to knit again. Yeah, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. So when we announced that this knit along was coming, there's so much excitement. Everybody loves this sweater. Yeah. It's so beautiful. What I love about it is that it's a really classic looking piece in the, in the structure, right? The beautiful ribbing and the shawl collar. I feel like, you know, that is so beautiful, but the fade itself, the way you've broken it up into these color sections, can you, we, people were saying, is this hard to knit? What sort of level of you, of knitters, if people are still on the fence, can you describe mm -hmm. the construction a little bit and yeah. the difficulty level you think that is for, for someone? So it is a top-down seamless raglan. So the nice thing is you don't have to seam any pieces at the end of it. Once it's done, it's done. Um, really, to be honest, the most difficult part is, I, I think, depends on, we're all different. So I actually kind of avoid putting difficulty levels on anything because what's difficult for me might not be difficult for you but sure. the techniques you'd want to be comfortable with or willing to learn for this pattern is going to be increasing for your raglans decreasing for your sleeves you are going to pick up stitches um, along the collar and there are short rows in that collar but if you're new to short rows garter stitch sh short rows are the easiest because they really hide anything it's so true. it's kind of a nice place to start with short rows but really the trickiest bit is the fading and all the fading is is striping so all you're doing is changing colors so the biggest tip I can give you I actually showed this in a little video earlier today but my entire knitting career, I have always had a knitting notebook. So this is one of my first that I pulled out earlier because I still have them all. And what I would do is I would go through, I would write the name of the pattern, the size I'm knitting, the yarn I'm using, and I would jot down rows I have to do things to make it easier because I don't trust myself. So I would write down like, okay, I would look ahead and be like, okay, this is telling me I'm going to increase my raglan every other row. So I would use a row counter and on something like this, it can be easy because it's like, oh, well, if I'm on the right side, I'm increasing, but you could also go through and you could write down each row you're going to increase on. And then you can just trust your row counter and you can put a little tick mark next to each one. I always do that for my sleeves. So my first sleeve, I pay attention to the rounds I'm increasing or decreasing on my next sleeve. I don't even have to think about it because I have them jotted down and I can go through and do that. But since this sweater does have you changing colors while increasing for your raglan, it's handy to just read through that section and jot down where you need to increase for your size because then you're not doubting yourself. But right. it's really, I think it's, I would say it's an advanced beginner. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I feel like if you're, I totally agree with all of that. I think it's not too difficult, but it looks complicated because of the striping and people think, Ooh, that yeah. it really is like dropping one yarn. And you are so clear in the pattern about okay. how many rows of color one and how many rows of your second color. And it's, it's literally, you repeat that every time there's nothing new and exciting. Once you've done it, mm -hmm. it is repeating that yeah. same thing, which is great. I mean, I feel like that can be relaxing and yes. predictable for us, which yeah, you know, we love watching TV and life happens while we're knitting. And so I feel like it's going to be easy to figure out where, where you're, where you are. And I love that idea yeah. about keeping track of your increases. Cause I feel like once that's done, once you've split, it's like smooth sailing. It is. You're just going to be like, Oh, that's when you're really going to Netflix because mm -hmm. from once you do this arm separation, you'll be good to go. And like Amy has all of her swatches. And I think if you do your swatch with your fade and make it a generous swatch, that'll also give you really good practice to understand the striping sequence. Because when you look in the pattern, it's going to give you an equation. So some people do look at the pattern, they're like, 
what do I have to do here? <laughs> but it's actually quite simple. And if you practice with your swatch first, then you'll feel much more confident while yeah. doing that in the actual sweater. Your pattern is beautifully written. Uh, very clear. Oh, I mean, thank you. You've had a little experience now, <laughs> um, but um, it is. I just mean you've written a lot of patterns, and they're always so beautifully written, clear, precise, lots of notes. Um, I feel like she's predicted all the questions we're going to have yes. as knitters. Yeah. And there's tips and tricks in there along the way. Yeah. So Amy, I see you're wearing your comfort fade in the. Is that the Winterfell fade that you've got there? Yes, I am wearing the Winterfell fade. That dark is so good. I created this fade for the, I think, I don't remember if we did a knit along, but it was when the comfort fade came out and I was like, I'm gonna make a fade for myself. And I knew I wanted to go from dark to light. And I had just come out with Winterfell in the North, part of my Game of Thrones collection. And so this is kind of how this one came about. It's really beautiful on you. I have a question. Did Andrea, how did you pick your yarn for this pattern? So Amy, I was trying to think of that because I think this is our first pattern together. Yes. It right? Is. Yeah, it's our yeah. first, it, it was, this was our first collaboration together. <gasps> That's so funny. Yeah, and so that was, and, but it was after we did a colorway together, maybe? I think no, we, that we create no we created this colorway for this pattern for this yes so yeah I was thinking about that today because I you know Amy and I have worked together a lot since then and I was like oh I think this is our first pattern which is so exciting and so we had started talking about the colorway so I told Amy she let me kind of pick what my dream yarn would be I was like I want a sweatshirt gray with my favorite bold colors as the speckles, which were like a poppy, a mustard yellow, like ochre and a blue. And then, so when this project came about, she created the fade for it. Oh, I love it. Lucky, that. how fun to have a custom fade like that oh, yeah. created. And then it's turned into this crazy thing. I mean, I feel like as knitters, who knew, like there was a time before fading and now we can't imagine, yeah. you can't imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's crazy, but I do uh -huh. have a little question too, Andrea. Some of us have a lot of yarn in our stash mm -hmm. and if, who knew? And if we were trying to make our own fade, you know, to yeah. use up what we've got already, do you have any tips and tricks for anyone? Or is that just like whatever you love? So I do, because I do, I, I've actually taught classes on this because it can stress people out. And um, I think that it sometimes people are like, I don't know what went wrong. Like maybe they tried it and they're like, I don't know what went wrong. So the main way that I like to describe it is if you visualize a piece of paper, this doesn't have the strongest stripes on it, but there's stripes on that paper. So this is the stripes of our sweater. Throw a handful of glitter on it. You've now obscured the stripes. So that's exactly what we're doing with speckles. So a lot of people, you can attempt a sort of fade with solid or tonal colors, but they're never gonna fade as well as a variegated or a speckled color because our eyes, their, their purpose is to look for contrast. That's how we see anything. So what we're trying to do by fading is we're trying to dull that contrast as much as we can from color to color. And the best way to do that is to have yarn that has different colors in it because it's going to blur those stripes, those lines for us. So typically the way I start, I'm looking around me like, do I have any yarn right here? I don't, not that's the kind I'd want to use. So typically what I do is I would pick a skein and I generally gravitate more towards speckles to do something like this or a variegated yarn. And so I would pick one color that I really love. There's my happy color. There's how I'm going to lead with my joy. Now I'm going to find my other favorite color that occurs in that yarn. So let's say it is uh, aqua yarn like this, and it has a little blip of poppy red or ochre. I would pick one of those colors, maybe depending if I want, you know, you can fade from one strong color to another, or like this sweater, you can just fade out. So this sweater, I just faded to a neutral. Um, Andrea Maury? 
and <laughs> um, so if you pick that color, then you kind of have your end caps and then I fill in the middle. So from there, I try to go on a, like a saturation level. Like just imagine you're turning down the dial with, with each skein. Yeah. So a great way to use up stash yarn is to kind of pick the one that makes you happy, pick a speckle in it to fade to, or choose a neutral to fade out. And then you can also use marling, which is holding two strands of yarn together. And that is going to have the same effect as the speckles or the variation, because it's going to break up those stripes for I you. That. So that's like a lot of us who have a ton of fingering weight yarn. Yes. You can that. knit any DK sweater in a fade yes. by just marling two strands of fingering weight together to create a DK yarn. And you can even keep one, let's say you have a lot of one color. You could keep that consistent throughout your entire sweater and just use different skeins to hold with it in segments all the way down. I actually so think that some... would be amazing. I do too. And yeah. very cohesive, like you're saying, right? Like you could have wild yeah. colors that you're holding with it, but if you had a medium gray or a soft gray, but you're holding like crazy neon hedgehogs, every, it's still it going to look, it all be washed yep. with gray. I love yes. that. That's actually a tool in painting. If there's too much contrast, like something that kind of makes you go, ooh, then you add in a neutral and it just turns the volume down on it. So mohair is another great way to do that. Oh. Hold one strand of a mohair and you can either do like keep the whole body in a solid and then use a speckled mohair to fade through, That's or fun. you could have fun different yarns as you're, um, as the ones you're trading out and use a neutral solid mohair all the way through. And it's just going to blend them all together. Well, Jody and I have always said, bless Andrea Mowry for the <laughs> fade technique, because we, when we were younger knitters, we only bought single skeins of sock yarn. Yes. So we would come home from like Knit City with 25 <laughs> single skeins of yeah. sock yarn that we bought at different yes. vendors that we fell in love with, but there's no way I can knit that many pairs of socks. So yeah. I feel like the whole fade technique whichever way you are going to sort of translate it whether it's a sweater or a shawl or cow like whatever those single skeins of sock yarn are your friend mm -hmm. yes I think that's why it took off honestly I think people finally went I can use my stash you know because we buy like your souvenir skein yes and we end up with so many of them it's like what am I going to do with this one mm -hmm. I mean even when we buy like three a lot of times it's like well I can't do a sweater with it. And I don't want to do a hat because it'll only be left with two. And so then you get afraid to break them up. So these precious little babies just want to be used. And now there's a way to use them and stretch them and combine them. I completely agree. I completely agree. This is so fun that we get a chance I to I feel like your a, brain. I'm a, so happy. I feel like it's a mini masterclass. It totally is. <laughs> Okay, um, let's talk about Amy's experience knitting the, because you've knit two, you said, you've knit two Comfort Fade Cardies. Um, everybody that's knitted, and I've heard it so many times, mm -hmm. they've re-knit. There are so many people that are knitting and re-knitting because it's so much fun. And somebody even said it's the sweater that when they wear it out, they get stopped the most by people that are not knitters and they want to know where Aww. they've purchased the sweater. So Amy- Aww. Yours is stunning. Is that your first or second comfort fade that you knit? This one is my second one. So the first one I did was just an all grays. And I am one of those knitters that likes to kind of hack patterns. Um, I'm not a designer. I don't have a designer mind, but I like to hack patterns for my body. And I so I knitting the first one, I learned some things that I was like, okay, so if I knit this again, I'm going to do this on it. And so there was just like basic things that I did that was really easy. Like I need more ease on the sleeve for my arms. I think and I so I went up, I went up a half needle size after I split the sleeves and knit the sleeves on a half needle size bigger. And that just that gave me just the, is. yeah, just the amount of ease that I needed for my sleeves to be comfortable. So my like, arm well, clocks don't fit in. A that is sleeve. such a good idea. Cause you don't have to worry about calculating how many more increases do I need? Yeah. Like literally just go up that needle size and you're going to get more, yeah, real, yeah. more room for the real estate, right? Yes. You're just going to have, I love that tip. Um, and if I, I look, can tack on to that. I, mean, I, I actually love that. Love I actually have started writing all of my patterns that recommend a, a sleeve needle 
which is a full size bigger than your needle. Because what I realized now that I've been doing this for as long as I have and through test knitting, almost all of us, I've yet to meet anyone who doesn't knit tighter in oh, small circumference yes. than they do in large circumference everyone's gauge tightens That's so and, and I do it. And so I was, and so I start, I had started going up a needle size for my sleeves kind of thinking like, it's my issue. And finally I was like, Oh no, this is like an everybody thing. So now I actually recommend that in all of my patterns because really? I don't think anyone really goes back and checks their gauge on their sleeve. And so they just think, Oh, the sleeve's too small. And it's probably that you just start knitting way tighter. Like it can be a stitch difference like it can be a big difference so do you how do you knit your sleeves mm -hmm. are you magic loop dpn i personally love like anytime i can knit that circumference on one small circular needle so i i i buy all those 16 inch but how do you like to knit your sleeves to get that perfect gauge that you're looking for i do magic loop yeah. i'm very much um i even have those little tiny shorties like the 12 inchers yeah, yeah. But I think those are ideal for English style knitters who hold their yarn in their right hand. For continental, I find it doesn't, it's not, at least for me. Okay. And, I, and it tends to be my friends who like them are English knitters. And I think it's just the way, but you know, the tips are like two yeah. inches. So yeah. I just, I have my needle case. It has all my, it has everything I need it. So I don't want to carry anything extra. So I've, I'm only knit on circulars. And I'm big Magic Loop fan. Me too, I love Magic yeah. Loop. And actually when you do it on Magic Loop, you don't have to change your needle as the decreases go, right? But if you right. start on a 16 inch, then I always have to change to Magic Loop at some point when things are getting smaller. Yeah. How do right, you like you to get down to the cuff? Maybe? Yeah. Same idea? I do Magic, I did Magic Loop for this one because it was helpful for me to delineate the beginning of the round for me when I was doing Magic Loop and things like that. And That's because amazing. we were fading and switching colors, I just do magic loop. I recently discovered these needles that I've been kind of showing in my lives lately. Um, they're called Crazy Trio. I think they're called Flexi Flips yes. in North America. Oh, and yeah. they're really cool. I don't have any here. But hold on. Actually, no, I don't have any here with me. They're at home. But it's three needles and they're flexible. And they're, I'm kind of a, I might be a convert to this for you magic know, loop. Funny that you say that oh. because they're basically like a DPN with a little uh, interchangeable, like a cable in the middle, not interchangeable, but the soft cable. So it's like a bendy DPN. And I never clicked with DPNs. I just, it was hey, never. You guys, I have stuff if you want me to show me, them. It just felt fussy and awkward. And so I just knit a little pair of fingerless gloves, but I actually knit the finger part of it. And I used those needles. And let me tell you, I was actually loving it. So you use yours for your mm. sleeves too then. I think that I'm going to try. I actually have been doing it for socks, but then I know that they've come out with longer versions. And so I was like the next sweater that I knit, I'm going to actually try to do my sleeves. I this. bet it would be great. I like them too, because yeah. the DPNs are so like stiff and awkward and this I pile of out. sticks. And... I pull the wrong one out and I'm all stitches. I think they're a really fun innovation, yeah. like a I newer do. thing. I think Addie hit on something there. Amy, these are the correct Uh-huh. If if anyone's out there that's that's not muted, maybe you could just mute yourselves for us. Um that would be great. Um okay, so a, a really beautiful feature, Andrea of this sweater is the collar. I mean amongst other things, but the shawl collar I feel like you see it right away. It's cozy with a capital C. It like is so, so cozy beautiful i love that it reminds me kind of like an, a grandpa cardigan like you know yeah mm -hmm. I yeah love that. amy you had mentioned you made yours a little uh narrower or tell us what you modified for the collar in case people wanted to maybe have a little less fabric so i did a little less fabric on mine i just didn't knit it as long as andrea said in the pattern okay. i just stopped I didn't change anything on the sequences of the, the short rows. I just knit less volume this way. That's okay. all. And also it was partly due to my impatience when I was knitting this because I was like, I want to wear this. And I stopped. So. <laughs> so is your collar then like the band down the front of your sweater narrower? Or how, yeah. how do you mean? 
So you did do less rows. So I did less rows all over. So this is actually not as deep as Andrea's. Hers is, okay. a, I'm mm -hmm. probably like, I don't know, five or six garter ridges shorter than Andrea's. Okay. So, so you have to be careful though, because those garter ridges for the collar are also for the front. Like right? your, your colors show on the yeah. front of the band, which is so cool. Yeah, I love that. No wonder this was so well received when it came out. I just think there's so many things about this sweater. I think I've seen it on every body type. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just so darn flattering on everybody. I, I, I understand the excitement. Yeah, totally. Somebody we had in our route or on Instagram was asking about, and this is something that I think is so good to talk about, especially if you haven't knit a lot of sweaters is the concept of ease. And yeah. that's kind of, really important when you're thinking about how you want your sweater to fit your body even though the picture yeah. in your shot in your your pattern fits you a certain way we can make this sweater fit us whatever way we want is there yeah. a way that you could share a little bit about that and also in relation relation to the schematic how we would choose a size yeah maybe? So the most important thing you can kind of like brush away everything but the finished measurement of that sweater. Okay. Cause that's really all that matters. So I try to, I always list, um, I don't do like pick your size by I'm going to build in your ease for you or anything like that. I just put the finished measurement because what you want to do is take your bust size. And I think I recommend zero to two inches of ease. I don't even remember. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Andrea. Um, so for instance, I'm now a 35 inch bus. So if it's calling for about, I'm like, I think I'd like a little extra ease. I don't want it to be zero ease on me. I want, I want to go to the high range of what the designer has said. So if it's two inches, I'm going to take my bus measurement and I'm just going to add two inches. Oh, so that's sorry. your important number you need to know. You had said two to four. Not that that makes any difference. There we go. Yeah, yeah no, so that's great. Okay, so, so you could pick five. between that range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say again, so I'm going to stick with my two inches. So for me, I'm going to try and find the size that's closest in its finished measurement to 37 inches because 35 plus two is 37. So then I can go look on the schematic and find right there. Okay, where am I on the sizes? Now, there might not be a perfect 37. So then I would decide, okay, do I want to go up? Let's say it's either a 36 or a 38. Maybe I'm falling right in between. Those are two really common sizes, a 36 and a 38. So then I'd go, oh, okay, I think for this style, it's an open cardigan. I'm going to decide, would I rather have a little less because I know I'm going to wear it open? Or maybe I'd even then look at the sleeve, which sleeve's going to fit me best? So then I could decide, okay, I actually think the sleeve circumference on the 38 is going to be more comfortable because I want to be able to wear it over long sleeve shirts. So I'm going to go with the 38 and you can kind of make an educated guess. I also highly recommend going into your closet and measuring a sweater you think fits you really well, especially if it's one that's a similar style to what you're going to be knitting, Great. because then you can go, oh, okay, this sweater measures 40 inches across the bus. It fits me really well. So I know that would be a good measurement to look for in the finished measurements, but yeah. I love that. Cause it, it is sometimes confusing when you hear things like, you know, five inches of positive ease. And then you think, look at the picture and go, well, does this include that ease or what does that mean? But I, yeah. I love the schematic. I feel like the schematic is your best friend. And I feel like if you swatch and you know your gauge mm -hmm. and then you go to the schematic, 99% of the time, you're going to end up getting a sweater that you've predicted pretty much what the size of it is going to be, but they kind of go together. You need to do the swatch yes. to know what your gauge is, right? Yeah. So that you can get that measurement. Um, I love that. I love that. And I feel like that's yeah. a really great way to choose whether you want yeah. it snug or looser or whatever you want. Yeah. And you do want to consider, especially depending on the style of sweater, the designer made those uh, ease recommendations for a reason. So you don't want to go too far out of that range without, unless you're, you know, a really experienced knitter who knows they can modify, they know this is going to work for them, but change, it's not just going to change your 
the bust, the chest circumference on that pattern, it affects ev all the shaping in that pattern. So that is something to keep in mind that the designer put in that recommendation for a reason. So don't go super far out of it or you might not end up with a sweater you like how it fits because That's it wasn't true. intended for that ease I, that you ended up picking. I've never thought of it. I just thought, geez, Andrea's saying two to four, but I like six to eight. I'm just gonna pick one bigger. It might just not be a great flattering fit when I'm finished. So you go also to the neckline, look at the neckline and like if it was a pullover, right? Like the ones where right. I shows my bra strap drive me crazy. So lots of times when I cast on a pullover, I'm really looking at that neck measurement. Like sometimes yeah. I cast on for a smaller size because the neck looks kind of body and I, and I want it to fit a little differently, but I guess you'd have to look at that sleeve too, right? Like if you're, I yeah. feel like with a loose kind of comfy cardigan, the reason there's a reason you designed a sleeve to fit this way, right? Right, right. Especially like anything that's going to be a little looser in the body, especially I like to balance that out with a slimmer sleeve. Um, but also like you were saying about the neck, I mean, you have to think like yoke depth can be another good measurement that people are kind of, so if you decide, well, I want, this sweater was only supposed to have, I had a test knitter once. The sweater that they were testing was supposed to have no ease, none. It was supposed to match their circumference. Well, they just decided to do 10 inches of positive ease. Wow. And then she sent me a picture and was like, I don't know what's wrong with this. There's all this extra fabric. And I was like, well, it's not supposed to have that much. It's all those extra increases. So now your yoke is like inches too long. Yeah. And, it, and there's other places you have to balance that out, like in the neck. Um, but if that's a common issue for you, having like this wider neck that you don't love that's showing your bra strap, what I've actually begun doing for certain patterns is I'll just cast on after the collar, if it's knit top down, do the whole sweater, and then I'll go back and I'll pick up stitches that's because it's going to give you a stronger neckline so it doesn't stretch out. And you can pick up less to tighten it up if you need to. Or do a little so you just have even, right? I love yes. that tip. That's such a good so you're tip. You're going to have a lot more control over, over that. that. There's yeah. a reason. And then you don't end up falling into a size that doesn't fit. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason why you're so good at this, Andrea. Jeez. <laughs> but honestly, these tips and tricks from experienced knitters, I think, I've learned. So I much. feel like it helps your confidence because I know starting a sweater for some knitters is like terrifying. They've had to buy all this yarn and it's going to take all this time. And oh my gosh, yeah. what if it's a horrible looking yeah. thing that I don't ever want to wear? So little tips yeah, like, it's an investment. like that, like the like ease and especially, I mean, gosh, I feel like we could do a whole other hour on pullovers, like <laughs> just that yoke depth thing, because I've done sweaters too, where I feel like it's really weird to wear them now because I put on a coat and the yoke is so deep and you're, you know, you've got that kind of bat wingy thing and then your body shifts up. That's anyway, attractive. There's all kinds of fun <laughs> things that I... <laughs> I feel like we could talk about, but I love that tip, especially about the reason the designer designed the sleeve to look like that and the body to look yeah. like that. You have to keep that in mind for sure. Is it surprising to you that this pattern is three years old and dyers all over are still dying comfort fade Cardi kits? You know, knitters like us are so excited to knit it for the first time and then people are knitting it repeatedly. Is that a surprise? How do you feel about that? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you never, one thing I will say, I have never been able to properly guess what will happen with a pattern. I generally am way off. Really? <laughs> so it's like, like find your fade. I was like, no one's going to like this. I sat on that pattern for six months and just wore it. And then finally I released it and it's what made my career. So what pattern like this, I'm just like, I don't know, maybe people will like it. I like it. But I try to knit things that I really want to wear that made me really happy while I was knitting them. So I hope that they have longevity in that way that they're fun and they're fun to wear. So mm -hmm. it makes me very happy to see like I, when Amy told me you were doing a knit on, I was like, oh, this is so fun. And yeah. It was so fun to put it on. And yeah, it's really exciting. I love that. I do. So, because it, what you do is a very solitary thing, right? It's like you're at home on your own and you're choosing yarns and choosing patterns that make you happy. And I guess you're right. You know, you go through the whole process and you put it out in the world and you must really never know what's going to happen. But people yeah. 
love that you took the fade and translated it all these different ways, like from socks to shawls to kids sweaters. Like how cute. Yeah. On a like kid. the little so faded pullover. Yeah. yeah. My daughter still wears it. And I knit that for her when she was two. See? It's like, it's like three, like almost elbow sleeve now, but she can still put it on. Oh my gosh. Maybe you can knit her a new sweater, Andrea. That would be really nice. I did. I did. She has her bean and olive sweater now. Yeah. That's so she wears cute. that a ton too. But thankfully most kids grow up first yes. before they start yes. growing out. So That's she's so true. What's yes. your favorite thing to design? What are you doing these days that's making you happy? I have been on a major sweater kick. I mean, I think I've already designed about five new sweaters this year. We're finally this morning. I was like, I need to knit a shawl. <laughs> like, I need to, I need to knit some stuff, maybe a hat. So um, I tend to lately in the past few months, I kind of immediately think of a new project in sweater terms. But I'm excited to kind of dive back into some accessories to balance myself out. And is that seasonal, do you think? Like now that the weather's warming up, do you think, I don't really need another sweater. I'm, I need a shawl. You know, I'll end up knitting the wooliest, heaviest thing in the summer because I want it by fall. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not that affected by seasons, except for maybe with color. I do think I tend to go a little like deeper and darker in the winter when the days are shorter and darker. And then as summer's coming, I start looking at bright colors like, oh, so I think color for me gets a little affected. That's funny. When we um, had the pleasure of joining Amy at her knit night, they asked us some really funny questions. And I thought it might be nice to ask you this one. And because like we totally it stumped us. So I apologize in advance for this, but if you, <laughs> right. Yeah. So if you, if Andrea Mallory was a knitted item, what would she be? What yarn would it be like? And why? Oh my God. I'm that's sorry. really I know. hard. It freezes I know. you in your tracks. You're bad. Well, I know. <laughs> um, and then after we're done, she'll have an idea and just like we did. Okay, well. Do you a sweater because well, you love them so much? Let's let you think about that for a couple of minutes. Okay, okay. You, it's hard. We were put on it's the so spot hard. and thinking. We should I be asking Amy. Amy, we would like to know this from you and Julia as well. Uh, I know we didn't tell you in advance either. I apologize, yeah. but I think it's kind of a fun question. Jody, you have to think of something too. What it's was okay. the question? You I, know, I didn't get to answer this question at my knit night. You didn't. Oh. You no. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, what would I be? I think that I would be a sock. Would you? Yeah. I like knitting socks. Honestly, this is like the one thing. I mean, I'm, it's up there with knitting sweaters, but I, I'm sitting here knitting a sock. Like I have, I like literally have like five sock whips right around me here. So I feel I'm like we're so connected that way. I love that. <laughs> I have so many socks. What color was your sock be? Pink. <laughs> what? That's, I, I have like a pink, pink sock right here. So. Oh, look at that. Okay, Julia, did you, what would you be? Um, I think last time we talked about being a knitting technique or something and I, I thought- know, I changed it a little, sorry. Yeah, I thought about the brioche stitch because it looks complicated, but it absolutely isn't. It's very simple yes. and it's plump and <laughs> <laughs> so cute. What color? So you I think I can guess. What color, Julia? Pink, hot pink? Hot pink, definitely. Fluoro morganite. That's oh, our, it's so good. Our current color obsession. So good. So Andrea, is this is a terrible question? You can say pass. No, I'll try. Um, so I think I would probably, I mean, I'll go for sweater, why not? And okay. I think it would be a little bit complicated. There'd be some kind of complicated stitch in there, but also something squishy. Mm -hmm. And the color would definitely be multicolors. I mean, we, we would definitely be shifting from one color to another, very moody. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. it. I love it. Well, thank but, you for answering that silly question, you guys. Um, I appreciate it. Do we have any questions from our um, awesome cast on party knitters? Julia was going to be monitoring the chat and going to ask some questions if there was any. 
Yes, there, there was a lot of chatter. There is a lot of chatter and people are asking questions and answering. So a lot of people have already answered some questions, but um, we had a few, I think, interesting ones that people would um, benefit from hearing. So one, the first one was any tips for picking up the stitches for the color with a neat edge? That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, so... Um, it will be pretty neat. The thing you want to make sure, I'm looking at mine, I'm just gonna take it off so you can see it. Um, so the best trick that I actually learned at my first Rhinebeck from Yasolda Teague was talking about picking up stitches. And the best rate of pickup when you're picking up from rows this way, so your rows are coming like this and you're picking up this way, the best ratio is five to seven. So you wanna pick up three stitches, skip one, two stitches, skip one. Three stitches, skip one, two stitches, okay. skip one. Or I, sh I guess I should be saying rows or what you're skipping in there. Right. But that will get you the most even pickup around your collar. Um, and to make it even, really the main thing you want to make sure of, and it can be a little tricky on here, but you can see that's my wrong side and that's a pretty tidy pickup edge. Um, so if you look closely, do you see how there's a full stitch next to it? The most common mistake that can make a pickup edge not look as tidy is people accidentally go through half a stitch. So you want to make sure that that row that's going up, that you don't knit into one leg of it. You want to make sure to go into both. Um, it can be a little trickier on this one since it is done on the reverse stock in that side, but you can just keep an eye on the back side. Um, but again, that ratio is really what's going to keep it tidy. Oh, that's such a good tip. So it's right on the very edge, the very first stitch, and you're going to go under both legs of the V. Well, it's mm -hmm. not going to look exactly right. like a V stitch, right? Because you're picking up from this side. But so what right. I mean is vertically, when you're looking at it, when yeah. you're going to go pick it up, you want to make sure that you don't go here in right. the yes. middle of that column when you're yeah, picking okay. up. And you can even go sometimes. So the thing is, too, when you're picking up into a raw edge, Sometimes it curls a little and it can be really hard to see. So you can either block your sweater before doing the collar and that's going to help it lay flat, which is going to make it way easier to pick up those stitches. Or you can go in, instead of just going in the very first stitch, you could go in two because it's just way easier to see. Yeah, I find I like that too. I actually and, do that myself. And that's what I usually do. Yeah, it does, yeah, that's it does totally save right. a lot of, because I've done that where I've picked up on the first and then picked up on the second and picked up, and then you turn it over and you look and you're like, ah, this looks terrible. So, but you can see that mistake for yourself. So a good idea is to keep flipping it over, I think, and just seeing that you're yeah. on the right track, right? Yeah, I mean, and it's not like it's a big flip because, you know, the collar's not on there yet. That's so you're true. just holding it just like this and just sticking your needle in. And it's actually that ratio becomes really easy to see because you'll see groupings. It'll be like three, two, three, two. That's so you can really quickly count by fives, which is nice when you have to cast on somewhere between like 200 and 400 stitches for a yep. big shawl collar. I love that. And yeah. I know when we're knitting a sweater, so if we do the body and then we do the sleeves and we think, oh, well, we just have the collar. Like that's not a big deal. Not with this one. I feel like with this one, you need to just give yourself time because the collar is a big element, right? There's a lot of knitting on your collar. Yeah. yeah, there is. The nice thing is it's garter stitch. It's really relaxing knitting. You do the short rows, you know, are all up here and then you end up knitting um, a little bit just straight. So it's nice. You do like a couple short rows and then you get to knit a few rows and then you continue them. So it's not, it's kind of like a fun, relaxing part of it. It's not too intense. Okay, good. I love it. Um, anything else that you've got there, Julia? Yes, a lot of people are actually asking about um, making the swatch. Okay. So Amy has knit so many yeah. swatches. Yeah, she's, I think, the swatch queen. Amy's the swatch queen. <laughs> um, I like to swatch. I'm just going to put that out there for everybody. If you guys don't know this, I love to swatch. So I think a big swatch for sweaters is really important for gauge. And also for me, when I first knit this sweater, I, I cast on 40 stitches. 
yeah, that's right. I cast on 40 stitches and I, I did the fade sequence so I could practice it um, the way that Andrea wrote it in the pattern. And it's really easy to remember. I actually use this fade sequence on everything that I'm fading, even if it's like something else that's somebody else's pattern, I wanna make a fade. I just, it's a genius, it's a genius sequence. And that way I could memorize it. Yeah. And yeah, I make my swatch. So this was the, this was the original. Is that from three years ago? Okay, well, this technically is not the original swatch because okay, I had okay. all my swatches stolen after a show a couple oh, years ago. Which we don't talk about. Yeah, but we, we've remade them recently. So it's been really fun to remake them again. So, Ed, so any tips? Um, so do you just think they should, they should make it big? They should follow the sequence in Andrea's pattern just so they get familiar with it. And yeah. make sure you block it, like block it before you're counting your gauge. Yeah, absolutely. I did, I wet block these. I also did like a nice garter stitch edge yeah. so that it will, it'll lay flat so that it doesn't roll afterwards for counting the stitches. Yeah. And um, I'm planning on making a little tutorial to show everyone how I weave in the ends so that Ooh. it's invisible. I love that. Um, and I did them on all of these swatches here. So I'll make that little video and pop that up into the, the knit along hey, thread. Thank you. So like, even when I did my swatch, I think I did about two inches in my color and then the fade, just like Andrea wrote in the pattern, which I think is another couple of inches um, and, and worked through all the colors, which was so fun, first of all. Can I just say this was the most fun swatch I've ever mm -hmm. knit. Uh, but it really does give you an idea of if your colors are gonna work, right? If you wanted to change anything at this point, if you didn't buy a kit, you know, maybe you've um, picked colors that you're not totally sure about. It's a really great way to start to see your sweater emerge, I think. It was a very, mm -hmm. very fun swatch to knit. I'm all for swatching, so. We're Totally. I can talk about swatching all day There's long. There's cricket. Guys. Crickets on the swatch. <laughs> hey, uh, we're we're close to being done, Julia. But was there something maybe you thought that was another good one to ask? Hmm. Someone asked if they needed to alternate skeins, and I answered no because you're already going to be striping with your other colors and fading. Okay. So I think alternating skeins, and I saw that question pop up a, a few times, would just give you too many skeins <laughs> attached to your project. Right. Only if you like torturing mm -hmm. yourself. I would <laughs> like, this is that pattern where you can just, even if you're someone that does that all the time, I think you can just throw it to the wind this time. Just knit mm -hmm. and enjoy your, your skein that you've got on them. How nice is that gonna be? Right. I feel like You'll I've been alternating anyway. skeins forever. Um, Andrea, without having to de uh, give us too much information, is there a new pattern coming out in the near future? We're not asking what it is, but is there something I um, would like to see your super secret project, whatever it is? No. <laughs> I can't show you the super secret, but there is a sweater behind me that I'm not good at hiding at all. <gasps> and that's coming out in April. Yay! Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Are you, I'm not I good at secrets. <laughs> not either. I blow it for people. You got to tell me to see. Don't tell me at all. You need to spell it out. Yeah. yeah. Well, that looks adorable. I love a pullover. I love your sweaters. It was such a pleasure to go to your Ravelry page and like go. There's so many patterns. It's yeah. just amazing. You're doing such amazing work. You were such oh, thank you. an amazing designer. And it's been such a treat to actually have a chance to chat with you about this fade thing we were joking the other day about what's a fade just this no. fade thing could really take off <laughs> totally i think she might have something here she <laughs> onto something no it really is i can't imagine as a knitter now like i feel like this is one of those things that is was revolutionary i really do yeah i really do your way of, of blending super fun hand dyed yarn was new and exciting well and you've put your fun flare on it and I think that's what attracted us you're you're adorable with your patterns with your color choices it's playful it's relaxed it's just meant to be fun and I think that's why people gravitate towards you um it we just get that from you oh, thank you so much 
Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you a million times for making time for us today. And I can't wait to get going on my cardi now. Okay. So it's officially on you guys. Our knitting has begun. This is it. The Ready, set, go. Comfort fade cardi from now till June. It's three months. It's relaxed. Don't stress. We're here to have fun. And um, we thank our guests so much andrea for joining us the designer of this beautiful pattern amy julia from la bien Ami, who has put these fade kits together the color experts yeah we are so grateful to have spent this time with you this morning thank you and thank you to everybody that hopped on here today thank you to everybody that has decided to cast on and join i mean there's nothing like commu uh, the community whether you have started your cardi already or you're still thinking about it or you're definitely gonna join in, it's not about finishing, although you know wearing a sweater is pretty awesome, but it really isn't. It's about connection. It's about all of us together. So there's that hashtag on Instagram. The and Ravelry gonna, group. And there's the Ravelry group, but there's the, also the hashtag on Instagram. Oh, yeah. So we're gonna be able to see your stuff different ways, however you feel like sharing it, but we are definitely gonna be in there seeing what everybody's up to. It's exciting, it's fun. There was a thousand of us here this morning, guys, between Zoom and Instagram or Zoom and YouTube. So I'm so excited that everybody else is so excited. Wow. Yeah, there was a thousand of us. We're gonna be together, we're doing this. <laughs> Let's be honest, I won't finish mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm finishing mine. I'm totally finished. I'm mine. a starter, but I'm I here. haven't picked my fade yet, you guys. So uh -oh. I'm making a new one for Ooh, this one. That would be fun. Like, let me tell you, if I had La Bien Ami, I would have a hard time picking two. Yeah. I feel like you mm -hmm. cannot go wrong, Amy. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what you choose. I will decide next week. I'll okay. share. I'll okay. share. <laughs> guys, and then maybe we can meet back here in three months. Yes. Would that be fun to do a, a yeah. celebration? Yeah. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just uh, get knitting. I'm so excited about that. I can't even wait. Yeah. We're sending love and joy to everybody today. Enjoy your weekend. Hug your neighbor. Love on the people that are close to you and um, do what we can to stand in that gap always. Absolutely. Happy knitting, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Amy, Andrea, Julia. Mwah.